Playoff basketball is in full effect. The play-in game is tonight, and you know what that means. It's not tonight. I understand that. But the playoffs start tonight. The play-in game, Wednesday night, LeBron versus Steph Curry. It's what we've been waiting for. Molly's in the house. Max is somewhat, damn it. But he's here, and your boy is back off of vacation. The crew is here. Holla at your boy. Whoa! Where are you on the play-in tournament? I want to see these games. There's a little randomness. I don't see the point of that. The I love this. Great idea. Whoever came up there need to be fired. Well, what do you think about the play-in tournament? I like the opportunity. Let the chips fall where they may. We're ready to go. Good day. Hope you all had a fabulous weekend. And welcome into First Take. Max Kellerman, I'm Molly Karen Rose, Stephen A. Smith. How was vacay? It was lovely. It was yeah. Lovely. It was lovely. Did you relax? Yes, I did. Relax. You, 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 okay. like, you like the tan, Molly. You like you the do. You got a little the, 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 the tan. tan. Everybody looks good with some yeah, vitamin D. Yeah, 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 it, yeah. You, you picked up go? some glasses from the future. I'm ready. Looks like I'm a ready. professor from the future. Well, 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 the professor is you, but I'm here to teach today. So let's roll. <laughs> Uh, always the teacher and always the student as well. That's the key. Let's go, guys. Uh, Steph Curry, the NBA scoring king for the 2021 season. The two-time MVP scored 46 points in 40 minutes Sunday in a 113-101 win over the Grizzlies. And now the scoring king will face King James, as in the Lakers. That is on Wednesday. Stephen A. Smith, you are up first. Who will be more dangerous in game one? LeBron? Well, Steph, I mean, when you talk about who's the scariest, who's the most dangerous dude, who's the person that you should be literally shaking and shivering at the thought of going up against, it's that brother Steph Curry. LeBron, you can pencil in the 25 to 27 the game. He's going to have a positive impact. He's the greatest player on the planet until further notice. We get all of that. But he ain't the greatest shooter, okay? The greatest shooter that God has ever created. The dude that has you petrified from the moment you step past half court. The one that has you shivering. The one that has you shaking. The one that has you in panic mode is one man. And one man above the crowd. And his name would happen to be Stephen Curry. The greatest shooter that God ever created. League leader. Mm -hmm. League leader. Scoring champion. Averaging 32 a game. Shoot 48% from the field. 42% from three point range. No Clay Thompson. An Andrew Wiggins who shows up sparingly. A Kelly Oubre who has a big gun. A Draymond Green who's your point forward and what have you. Steve Kerr's done a fabulous job coaching him, by the way. Let's give him props. But in the end, when you talk about fear, when you talk about danger, when you talk about somebody that forces you to be absolutely positively petrified, it would be one man and one man above the crowd. And his name would be Steph Curry. You're wrong. The answer is LeBron James. But I can't blame you for being wrong, Stephen A, because I spoke to your former college teammates. When you passed Stephen A the ball, what happened? Oh, he was going to shoot. <laughs> we weren't getting it back. I said, I know the feeling. So you make the mistake a lot of people make, which is when you hear offense, you're thinking scoring. You're thinking scoring. But Stephen A, there's a lot more to it than that. As your teammates will tell you, there's a lot more to it than that. And of course, scoring the ball. Steph, the greatest shooter God ever created, as you always say, is also as hot as he's ever been. My God, shooting the ball, there's no doubt. But it ain't one-on-one. -on -one. It's five-on-five -five at any given time. And not only is LeBron a little bit of an underrated shooter, he's six foot eight, 250 plus pounds, can take it to the rack, oh yeah, and has as good court vision as anyone who ever lived and is in the argument for greatest passer of all time. So that guy, in terms of leading an offense, dangerous on offense, is the answer. To mention nothing of the matchups. Lakers are really good defensively, right there. You ain't gonna stop Steph, but the Lakers have the best chance. What are you gonna do against LeBron James? There's no matchup for LeBron James. 
the answer on offense. Forget about defense. We know the answer there. Just knock the microphone down. I was so excited. We know the answer there is LeBron on offense. He's the most dangerous. Well, Max Kellerman, I'll forgive you. I mean, I won't get, I won't come down too hard on you because, I mean, far be it for me to, to, to enlighten you and, and to edify you in terms of vocabulary because we know how supremely gifted you are with your vocabulary. But the word dangerous is the operative word here. See, you get to plan for LeBron James. Now, it's obviously difficult to, to stop, and we get all of that. But you can game plan around. You can sit up there and pencil in LeBron for 27, 7, and 7. Those are career averages of his. You can do that and still plan accordingly around that. You know what you can't plan around, Max? Some brother walking past half court and hitting from 40 feet. Some brother that just shoots it from the parking lot. Some brother that just sits up there and extends your defense and compromises you in such a way that you can't plan for it. You're a little, you're literally a coach and you're just throwing your hands up in the air. There's nothing you can do. You can game plan around LeBron James. Doesn't mean you can stop him. Doesn't mean you can stop his effectiveness, his efficiency, or anything like that. Doesn't mean that when he's healthy. But Steph brings a different dimension. And that word dangerous comes into play because what I'm saying is when Steph is flowing on an elite level, the impact that he has on the game is so profound that it even usurps and eclipses that of a LeBron James. Because when you're pulling up from 40 and you're making those shots and you're forcing a defense to extend and compromise themselves to that degree, no, you're not holding the ball, being a point forward and running the offense that way. But what you've done is you've made every Everybody else vulnerable. Last week, I'm in the islands, yep. and I take the opportunity to watch first take. By the way, all of y'all did a very fabulous job in my absence. Thank you very, very much. And I'm watching, and y'all showed, and I produce the extraordinaires, showed these highlights mm -hmm. of Steph Curry being guarded. And, all, and Kendrick Perkins, if I remember correctly, was the one that pointed it out. It wasn't one. It wasn't two. It wasn't three guys guarding Steph Curry. There were four people on them. They said, we'll leave the other four guys open. The hell with it. Make a shot. As long as it's not him. That has never happened with LeBron James. Well, you could say that, but I remember in 2016 in the finals, LeBron blocked the Steph Curry shot, screamed on him like he was his dad. It's a Wu-Tang line, Stephen A. And I saw I, Steph I Curry I'll hang his head, Look, walk away, and then the, I, I'm sure, of course. And, and then in game seven, four minutes and 22 seconds left mm -hmm. to become the greatest team of all time at home, fourth quarter, Steph Curry, the conductor of the greatest half court offense in the history of the game. The guy who you're saying is the most dangerous player in these playoffs couldn't muster a single point from him or his teammates. The last Can I stop you right there? Can I stop you right there before you go further? LeBron James. Can I stop you right there? And his team won. I just want to stop you right there for to go further because while I was going, I heard you bringing this up. I heard you bringing this up. On this show, I assure you, Kendrick Perkins, Marcus Spears, Lewis Riddick, mm -hmm. Molly Karen Rose, it, the list goes on and on. They might not be able to stop your drivel about LeBron James and what happened years ago, but I'm going to stop that right now. Max Kellerman, I will remind you that four or five, five years ago, when you talk, when you keep bringing up LeBron's performance in the finals against Steph Curry, Mike, Max Kellerman, I don't even know if you had face you here back then. I had an afro. My hairline was two feet four. There's a lot that's happened in the last five years. Okay, stop bringing up five years ago. My God, Kendrick Perkins wasn't even uh, rocking his beard at that particular moment in time. If I remember correctly, I think he was a little clean shaven. Lewis Riddick might have had an afro back then. Who the hell knows what talk Marcus about three years was ago? doing? There's a lot that's happened in the last five years, Max Kellerman. And by the way, Steph yeah. Curry... And you know LeBron what James went against each other in the finals. How many four times? How many times? Four. How many championships did Steph Curry win? Three. Stop. Hold now, up. The, you might was get away. LeBron without you KD. might get away with that drivel on some other show, on one of your many other shows. Every time I turn on the TV or the computer, there's Stephen A. Smith. Not the last week. But not not here, brother. Not the last week. Not, last not week. here, brother. N not here. The first time they met in the finals, Kyrie and Kevin Love got hurt. LeBron I agree. still took them six. Would have won that series. It was still and you know it. against LeBron. The next time, LeBron beat them. Then they had to go get KD. And who was the best player on that team? KD. Go oh, what a shame. LeBron's numbers Let's stop in those the playoffs. Let's not depress this, Molly. 48, KD. 12 KD was 12 the best on player. The regular.
Steph Curry wasn't better than KD. I mean, stop the questions. I mean, KD might go down as the greatest scorer in NBA history, the most off- the most lethal offensive force this game has ever seen when his career is over. But far be it for somebody to be inferior to Kevin Durant. I mean, my God, stop the presses. The fact is, when Steph yeah, but you know who's played not with inferior babies, to Kevin Durant? they beat LeBron. That's the bottom line. And so you need to understand. All I'm asking you, know you not to do is inferior to Kevin Durant. I, I, I'm not compromising the facts here. I'm not saying that you're wrong about those things. Things in terms of what you're pointing out. I'm simply saying, stop bringing up five years ago as if it equates to now. And by the way, Steph Curry didn't always, That's Steph Curry easy. wasn't 100% healthy. Steph Curry was unhealthy. Steph Curry has showed up in plenty of post seasons in NBA Finals and showed up. Stop treating him like he's some choke artist or something. That's not who he is. Let's not go back. Let's not go back five years. Okay. Let's not go back three years. Let's go back last year. Who won All the right, championship? Last word here. Well, go back one year. Oh, hold on, hold on, the best player in the world won the championship. LeBron Steph James. Curry, Steph Curry played in five games last year. Klay Thompson didn't play at all. What are you talking about? Why are you holding it against him? Oh, Dangerous is the operative oh, word. Dangerous. When, dangerous. Very dangerous. Okay. Steph Curry is very dangerous. That's right. All right, Lakers Warriors Wednesday LeBron. on ESPN 10 Eastern. Can't wait for that. But, guys, can we just talk about what happened last night? There's plenty more to get to. Please take a look at this play. Dotson loses it, walking the tightrope. Oh, Blake Griffin, razzle dazzle. Oh, next level. Kevin Durant, the rack attack, and one of the highlights of the year. Um, looking like a clinic. There was a Nets big three sighting for the first time since February 13th. Katie, James Harden, Kyrie Irving played in just their eighth game together. During Saturday's win over the Chicago Bulls, Brooklyn's route over Cleveland Sunday settled the rest of the Eastern Conference playoff picture. The Nets are set at second place and will face the winner of the Celtics-Wizards play-in game. Max Kellerman, who's more important in these playoffs? Is it James Harden or Kevin Durant? The answer is James Harden. And by the time the dust settles, James Harden will win finals MVP this season. And I understand why people get this wrong, right? You look at the Warriors, KD is, Stephen A. the best player on that team, even better than Steph Curry. Won back-to-back championships on that team. He joined a 73-win team, right? And people look at this team, while they're kind of like the Warriors again. Here comes KD. Uh Uh-uh. This team is more like the Rockets, Stephen A., because people like you who said D'Antoni's system doesn't win championships were wrong. D'Antoni, who's really coaching this team, when Harden's on the floor. Harden and D'Antoni are running the Rockets' offense. D'Antoni's system resulted in a team that had no business competing with those Warriors, the 73-win Warriors that added KD, the team that you know LeBron and Kyrie and Kevin Love had no shot against, but they were hosting a Game 7. Without Chris Paul, missed 27 straight threes, still only lost by single digits. James Harden running D'Antoni's offense. Now give him KD and Kyrie and watch what happens. Don't have to. Already saw it this year. KD without, with Kyrie, no Harden. They're a 500 team, give or take. Every permutation of players you want on that team, not that great until Harden's on the floor. With KD or with Kyrie or by himself, this man wins four games to every game he loses. He and D'Antoni are running that system with KD and Kyrie. Most important guy in that system is the point guard. That's James Harden. The answer is James Harden. You're wrong, but I understand where you're coming from because you're looking at James Harden and what we've seen this year, and he's been nothing short of sensational. And when healthy, he was the leading candidate for league MVP honors. We all get that. Okay? We understand that. I thought I had to sneeze. I'm sorry. Here's the reality. You don't get to say that because you've religiously been on this show, Max, highlighting how unimportant the regular season is. It's about the postseason. We haven't seen James Harden produce in the postseason yet this year. And in the years past, whereas people like myself and others have said he could have played better but still gave him some credit for some of the things he did, you called him a choker. Okay, so now we get to KD. And when we look at KD, let's understand something. KD is averaging 27 a game, 26.9 to be exact. 53% shooting from the field, 45% shooting from three-point range. Arguably the most efficient offensive superstar we have seen. Maybe ever. And when I look at it from that perspective and I take into account the postseason, to me it comes down to KD. 
I don't give a damn what Harden does or what Kyrie does. Without KD, the Brooklyn Nets are going home. They ain't winning no championship. They ain't beat Milwaukee. I don't think they beat Philadelphia, to be quite honest with you. That's where I'm at with it. With KD, without Harden or Kyrie, not both, but without one of them, I still think Brooklyn could come out of the East because that's how lethal Kevin Durant is. So I only say that to say, not to diminish the greatness of James Harden in any way, because make no mistake, we are talking about greatness when we talk about James Harden. But when you talk about the most important component, you can bring up what happened in the regular season, the eight games that they played together only, how the team looked with Harden and how they've looked without him. You can bring up all of that. But my argument to debunk that is that that's not the playoffs. That's a regular season that you swear you haven't cared about. And in the end, when you look at James and Kevin Durant, you, the only reason why you are considered a favorite to win the championship is because of the assumption that Kevin Durant is going to be available. Period. Yeah, well... I would say the same goes for Harden. You're right about KD. No KD, we're not taking them to get out of the East, maybe. No Harden, I'm not taking them. I, no Harden, I'm telling you right now. Without James Harden, Eastern Conference Finals, Bucks, Sixers. You're sleeping on how important he is if you think that's not the case. And by the way, you're absolutely right to point out the fact that I have brought up religiously that he has choked. I've called it choke. When you need him to be hardened the most, in the biggest games, he has not been. In the biggest moments, he has not been. Hit the shot, James. Don't worry about getting the call jumping under Draymond's legs. Can the shot. You'll be all right. Too many situations like that. What I'm telling you now, and you know I've said this every postseason, every year, to me, he gets a little more comfortable, a little more comfortable. And this year, Stephen A., everything James Harden said about him, he's never been a selfish player. You know I'm on the record. I know you are, too. He's never been a selfish player. He's done what his team has needed. You need 35 points. Here's, you need 50. Here's your 50. On this team, they don't need that. They don't need him to play hero ball at the end of the game. He could get 23, 12, and 12, or whatever he would get. And let KD cook and let Kyrie cook. That's fine. He just has to run the offense. And no one this year, no one in the NBA this year, including LeBron James, has been as good running their offense as James Harden. Well, listen, again, we're not taking anything away from James Harden, but I forgive you for your ignorance about the game of basketball because in playoff competition, as Tom Thibodeau pointed out uh, during his post-game press conference after the New York Knicks won their three home games to close out the season and secure the number four overall seed in the Eastern Conference, by the way, after the New York Knicks did that, okay, taking over New York City, taking over after they did all of that. Tom Thibodeau educated us by highlighting the fact that come playoff time, you all know what plays are going to be run. You know what everybody is going to do. It comes down to, at times, here's the basketball. You are a superstar for a reason. Take us there. Mm -hmm. And we all know what James Harden is capable of doing. But the reason why Max is raving about him is because – James Harden has been running the show, yep. which is, you know, so supremely well since he's become a Brooklyn Net. I'm saying that come mm. playoff time, there's going to come a moment in time where you give him the ball and you say, take me there. Now, Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving are all capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, who's the alpha? Who's the dude that you're going to trust most? Now, that don't mean Kyrie going to give him the ball. But the point is, we all know who should have the ball. We all know that when crunch time arrives, sure. when money time arrives, KD. we know the one person that should have the ball in his hands. We know who that is. What did KD say years ago yeah, when that whole Patrick that. Beverly controversy stood up? He said, you know, I, I could do this, I could do that, but I'm Kevin Durant. You know who I am. You know who I am. That's what he said. And that's what we remember. Period. Yeah, that's right. And Harden will find him if and when he's open. He might also find Joe Harris to hit a wide open shot or Kyrie if he's in a better position. Harden's the guy who's going to be making those decisions. And by the way, Stephen A., when Shaq and Kobe played together and Shaq was the best player on earth and everyone said it, he won, what was it, 99, 2000 or 2000, 2001? And everyone knew it, right? Who was the closer? Kobe. KD can be your closer. He's seven feet tall with a seven, six wingspan. You talk about that all the time. Can hit from a million miles. Yeah, he's a better player, really, or at least scorer. 
than James Harden in that situation. That's okay. That doesn't mean he's the most important player on the team. And by the way, because he has James Harden on his team, he'll know and everyone on the team will know that the right guy in the right position is going to get the ball at the right time. And that's why, if they're all healthy, the Nets are that's, unstoppable. That's, right. that's where we are now. We're next. <laughs> but, it's the right guy at the right but let, time. Let's just, play the right let's way. Let's forget that's about now. who's oh, most please. important. You know what we can all agree on? Yeah. We have all three back at the perfect time, and that's what they, we wanted. And we'll see the Nets play the winner of Boston and Washington. So thank goodness for that. All right, if the Celtics lose their playing game, might that spell the end of Brad Stevens' career in Boston? Austin, should Stevens be on the hot seat? Paging Stephen A. Smith. And how about this for a debate? Which is the better Hall of Fame class? Kobe Duncan Garnett or Stockton Robinson Jordan? The guys split hairs, but pick a side. Okay, uh, we'll try to get through this. This is the most nervous I've ever been in my life. You are an exceptional person. Thank you for teaching me about basketball. But even beyond that, Teach me that's not all about basketball. It's a big deal for me to pay homage to the ones that came before me. Magic Johnson, thank you for your inspiration. Michael Jordan, thank you for being a big brother, the constant. I want to thank you for the bald head secrets. I appreciate it. I appreciate it if you give me the secrets on how to grow it back. You did it. You're in the Hall of Fame now. You're a true champ. You're not just an MVP. You're an all-time great. I'm so proud of you. I love you forever and always. Kobe Bean Bryant. Kobe Bryant's rock right there. Vanessa Bryant, such a queen. Over the weekend, Celtics legend Kevin Garnett, Spurs great Tim Duncan, and the global icon that is Kobe Bean Bryant were all inducted into the Pro Basketball Hall of Fame. LeBron James, Stephen A, called these three inductees the best class ever. Would you say LeBron's right? I think he is. I think he's absolutely right. I'd like to go down the list, uh, okay. ladies and gentlemen. You know, if we're talking sizzle and pizzazz, then obviously there's something that falls short there when it comes to Tim Duncan, because Tim Duncan was never about the sizzle. He was just a born winner. But let's take this into consideration. We've got Kobe Bryant here, 18 all-star appearances, 11 first-team all-NBA spots, and five championships. We have Tim Duncan, five championships, 15 all-star appearances, and 10 first-team all-NBA nominations. We've got Kevin Garnett, an NBA title, 15 All-Star appearances, and four first-team All-NBA. Ladies and gentlemen, think about that. That's 11 championships, okay? That's 11 championships. Again, you've got 48 All-Star appearances, all right? When you talk about first-team, that's 25 first-team appearances as well. Nothing has ever been more decorated. Then we don't even bring in Kim Oki into the situation. She's a national championship, okay? To make catches, we don't bring her into. She's a champion. I mean, it's champions all over the place. Rudy Tom, Tom Rudy Tom Janovich is a two-time NBA champion as a coach. And so when I look at it from that perspective, there's just no denying how decorated this is, how decorated these individuals were. Uh, again, it was devoid of the sizzle per se, even though I think that Kobe Bryant, obviously his 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 appearance, you know, his presence rather, you know, definitely brings uh, a sizzle to the equation. It's just that because of his tragic passing, we obviously have to look at it, and, and that's not the appropriate word to use, but we know what he would have brought if he were alive and in presence there, and he was just such a Vanessa did thing. do a tremendous and job, was, and we'll play she, part of that speech she, and react to it she later was in the show. She was phenomenal. It was touching. It was heart-wrenching. Yeah. It, 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 it just broke my heart to see her because I just think about her and what her and her wonderful children are going through right now, not being with him, not being with, the, with Gianna as well. So it's definitely painstaking, no question She's about it. She's an exceptional it. woman. Grace she, under fire. Phenom She's phenomenal. beyond impressive. Phenomenal, and Kobe loved her daily. And so you take that into consideration, uh, but you look at the decorated, these decorated individuals, there's just no denying what we witnessed and what we saw. And I think it's the greatest class ever. There's a very good argument for that, but I want to stick up for the Michael Jordan class. First of all, because they have, it has two players in it that have become totally underrated by history. I'm tired of the way Stockton gets talked about in the media, especially on this show. Like, Stephen A., I liked Isaiah Moore because his peak 
he won championships, right? And he could score whatever you need him to do it. But like by a little over Stockton, people are snoozing on John Stockton right now. Jordan went in with David Robinson and John Stockton. Stockton has the all-time assist lead, Stephen A, by almost 4,000 assists. If you look at number two, three, four, they're all like bunched together. This one's 1,500 ahead of this one, 500. He's 4,000 ahead of the next guy. And that's because he went to 10 all-star teams because every single year he was having seasons where if you look at the stats, you could say he didn't win championships, that's fair. But if you look at the stats, he was having seasons that fit into other point guards' greatest seasons. Maybe they had four or five of them. And Stockton had like 15 of them. Stockton was all NBA twice. He was all second team six times. He was all third team a bunch of times. He was a great defensive player, Stephen. That gets lost. David Robinson. This dude, like... Would I take Duncan over Robinson? Yes, in the end, I would. Olajuwon got Robinson when it mattered most. But we had, like, David Robinson's one of the best to ever do it. And the numbers he put up are ridiculous. Man scored 70 points in a game, won the MVP, had season after season after season where you look at him and what's the difference statistically between him and Shaq or someone like that? Over seven feet tall, could run the floor, switch defensively. Well, like, what do you need him to do? He was a total monster on offense and defense. So those two guys just get slept on nowadays. And then, by the way, in that same class is the greatest player who ever played any sport, Michael Jordan. So I think you kind of get extra weight for that. I'm just saying, I get it. Kobe and, and, and Duncan and Garnett are all like, you know, two guys in the top 10 or 15 and another guy in the top 20 or 25. I get it. But I think Robinson and Stockton both getting slept on with the greatest player who ever lived has to get some consideration. Well, Max Kellerman, I do really deeply appreciate you going on that lengthy soliloquy just to say that you agree with us because you didn't sit up there and make an argument against the 2020 class, you know, the, the, you know this, this weekend's class being uh, the, the elite class. What you're saying is, is that you Notice wanted that. to make sure that the others get their respect. I don't recall anybody disrespecting John Stockton. I don't recall anybody disrespecting, you know, Michael Jordan or anybody else or David Robinson. But since you brought those names up, let me remind you, John Stockton never won a championship. Now, granted, it's because Michael Jordan got in his way not once but twice, but he never won a championship. Carl Malone, same thing, 0-3 in the finals, never won a championship. David Robinson, for years, for years, everybody was looking for the admiral. Uh, the admiral. A matter of fact, it got to a point in 94 where we said, okay, this is your time when we're going to see him go up against Akeem the Dream Olajuwon. And a dream, the uh, team, the dream, Elijah one destroyed him. And I love me some Dave Robinson. So the fact of the matter is, it wasn't until Tim Duncan arrived that the San Antonio Spurs, and specifically David Robinson, won the championship. And oh, by the way, it was against a completed the Knicks team that didn't have Patrick Ewing because he was injured. And you had the Marcus Cambys and the Larry Johnsons and the Latrell Sprewells of the world. But there was nobody to guard the Twin Towers. Okay, nobody formidable That's on the true. interior. So you got all of that going on. What I'm saying is you're not disrespecting anybody by pointing out that they're not number one. That's almost like LeBron being sensitive because we said, oh, my God, stop the presses. There's been how many thousands upon thousands of NBA players in the world, and the NBA has existed since 1950, really 1946, before it was really 1950 that they took off and they were the NBA. And we call LeBron James the second greatest player in the history of basketball and stop the presses. It's an thing. insult. It's an insult in some people's eyes. It's an insult that we call them number two instead of number one. So you're better than everybody else on the planet age, but one guy. Yes. And one th thing. that's how your argument sounds right now. One thing about being destroyed by Olajuwon. Olajuwon stopped Ewing. He stopped Shaq when Shaq had Penny and Grant and Nick Anderson. He was crewed up. No. Dennis Scott was crewed up. Olajuwon stopped Robinson, Shaq, Ewing. Olajuwon may have stopped anybody at that point. Like, you no. have a case that peak Olajuwon was as good as it's ever been. So coming in second to that guy is okay. And yeah. by the way, Garnett got one, and Garnett's great, but Garnett had two other Hall of Famers with him in Ray Allen and Paul Pierce to get the one, okay? Just like Robinson got his one with Tim Duncan. All right, that happens. Stockton never won a championship. I agree. That what's, that's what places him third in this group. So you just want to echo He's, what we're saying? Like when we talk what's about the, the all-time, 
When we act like, when we talk about the all-time point guards, you act like you can't even make a case for Stockton when we bring up Isaiah. Oh, you can make a strong because case. I, can't, I like no, no, Isaiah no, no, by no, that much. No, no, you no, no, no. You're case. being disingenuous. And Isaiah Thomas himself already checked you on this on national television. It's not that we're not, it's not that we're disrespecting John Stockton. It's not that we're not acknowledging that he was a Hall of Famer and a great, great, great point guard. The argument was he wasn't Isaiah. He never should have been picked over Isaiah to be a member of the Dream Team, and we know that it was off-the-court relationships the that hindered Isaiah Thomas from being on the original Dream Team because one of the biggest catastrophes in the history of basketball is that Isaiah Thomas wasn't on that original Dream Team in 1992. But at the time, and everybody knows it. Stephen A., right, because, because they had some guys that were a little past it and still on the team. I agree with that. But at the time, Stockton was better. Stockton was still killing, killing the league. Like Stockton, what could Stockton not do? He's a great it's, defender, it's, all first team NBA defense. He for, could shoot the three, they oh, just didn't a do it a lot back Stockton, then. He could run the pick and roll to perfection. The he led the league in assists by a million every year. What, listen, listen, I'm telling you right now, I swear to God, I'm gonna go up to the bosses. I'm gonna I'm gonna have you to I'm, I'm gonna tell them to stop letting you talk basketball. I'm serious, I'm serious. Listen, you can't do this. Don't act like for Stockton the same thing, do John Stockton? offensively. Hold on, stop it. Stockton could do what could he do offensively? I can point out plenty of things he couldn't do offensively. He's a great, great point guard and floor general, but he had his limitations offensively. And we all know this. Anybody that watched want, basketball knows that about Stockton. In the what end, you want when you from talk your about point guard. In 1992, when you want to say he was better than Isaiah, Isaiah was literally about to retire, and we all knew that right. with the guys That's that you had, had the on the team, team they, they weren't picking the guys based on where they were then. Then. They were picked because you, the, the, the squad you assembled could beat anybody in the world, as they showed. You were picking them better on resume, Stephen and Stockton's a. resume did not compare Stephen to a. Isaiah in Thomas, the end, and nor did the eye test. In the That's end, you fact. know I like Isaiah over Stockton, but it's by a hair, and you act like it's by a mile. How can you argue that it's a travesty you shouldn't be bringing that the guy who has the all-time assist here. record that. by 4,000 assists almost has no business on the Dream Team? Fourth, he's 4,000 assists. I didn't say he had, he had no business. Two. I did not like, say he had no business. Like, 3,800 assists. Okay, you, you see, what you want to do is recreate a narrative and lie over the national airwaves about what people's positions are. Nobody oh, said that Stockton did not belong on the team. What they said was he should never have been picked ahead of Isaiah Thomas. The argument was him versus Isaiah, not his legitimacy for being on the team. Nobody questioned that about well, Stockton. Just that he didn't belong there against well, Isaiah, ahead of Isaiah. Everyone knows that. The guy who didn't belong on that team was Christian Leitner, but that's a story for another day. Stockton was fine on that team. He did belong. <sighs> they had a college guy who was okay. college player. I can't wait year. for that story right. another day. You know. When we come back, Sunday night, LeBron revealed his pick for MVP. It's Steph Curry. Was this gamemanship by LeBron or sincere facts? The fellas debate that. Plus, the 76ers land the one seed. How much pressure is on them compared to Giannis and those Bucks? Stephen A. and Max on which team is under the most pressure? Quick takes. Let's go. Stephen A., how far can your Knicks go? New York, stand up. New York, stand Answer up. We, we win in the first round. We win in the first round. We beat the Hawks. It might take us seven games, but we doing it. I'll, I'll be at every game of that oh series. Boy. New York you and the spite. ATL, okay? We win in that first round series, and then we go give the Sixers a run for their money. I reserve the right to touch on that subject after we handle our business in the first round. Okay, let's not get carried away. Uh, Max, <laughs> will the Heat upset the Bucks? New York stand up until the second round, then sit down. Uh, no, the Heat won't upset the Bucks this year. They have chances, but you know what the difference is? Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday is the type of dude that might have played on the Heat, right? He's that kind of player. Stephen A would say rough rider. When it matters most, he comes up big. I don't think it's enough to win a championship, but enough to get you by the first round. Stephen A, is there more pressure on Philly or Milwaukee? It's definitely the Milwaukee Bucks. Okay. Uh, Philly could have its expectations, but it's yet to be, you know, seen. In the case of the Milwaukee Bucks, they were in the conference finals with a 2-0 lead on Toronto two years ago last year and lost that four straight. Then last year, they lost in five. 
You got Giannis Antetokounmpo. You just acquired Drew Holiday. You got P.J. Tucker. You're better defensively. Uh, you still have perimeter shooting and athleticism. A lot's expected of Milwaukee and Budenholzer and the Greek Freak, and they need to deliver. There's more pressure on them than the 76ers. All right, gentlemen, here's a look at the final Eastern Conference standings. Marinate on that. Sixers top seed followed by the Nets and Bucks. The play-in matchups will be the Celtics, Wizards, and Pacers, Hornets. But I want to focus on the Celtics, Max, who have not lived up to expectations in this regular season. Max, if the Celtics don't make it out of the play-in tournament, do you think Brad Stevens should be out of a job? You talking to me, Molly? Yes. yes. Uh, no, I don't. Brad Stevens, uh, I, I realize he'll be under pressure. Steve Nay, there's enough chatter that where there's smoke, there's fire. But he shouldn't be. Of course he shouldn't be. The man lives in the Eastern Conference Finals. Three out of the last four years, he's in the Eastern Conference Finals. Then one season where Kemba's hurt, where COVID and COVID protocols destroy the roster. And by the way, Stephen A., when you were like, well, Gordon Hayward's playing too much. Why is he in the starting lineup, lineup out of, off a catastrophic injury? And I told you then, coach liked his passing in the starting lineup. Look what happens when you took that out. It's station-to-station -station type stuff. The ball doesn't move the same way. So, so one season, he's not done. And now Jalen Brown is out? He's not entitled where you're missing your point guard, COVID and COVID protocols. You don't have the guy you relied on to keep the ball moving. And, and, and then your number two best player is out. If he gets bounced, he should lose his job three out of four. You know, when the chip and we have the personnel and his voice is not the voice that we need. On countless occasions, we found situations where coaches ended up. Larry Brown went to back to back trips to the NBA Finals and won the championship when he departed from Detroit. There's a litany of times where we can point to where coaches went, were at a particular place and at some point in time, you just got tired of hearing that voice and there was a new voice that was needed to maximize whatever potential existed. The two stars of your team is a 24-year-old by the name of Jalen Brown mm -hmm. and a 22-year-old by the name of Jason Tatum. And on the sports talk in Boston and in the papers and the tabloids and beyond, they are talking about how these guys sort of tuned him out. Now, in fairness to Brad Stevens, I interviewed Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum said on Stephen A's World, on ESPN Plus, and Jason Tatum said, no, that's not true. OK, so I want to make sure we're fair to Brad Stevens in that. But there is absolutely nothing wrong with us looking at them and saying, wait a minute. With two stars like that, you're supposed to be better than the 500 squad, regardless of, of, of what's transpired with, with, with Marcus Smart or Kemba Walker, whatever. As we've watched this team periodically throughout this year, they have been on a roller coaster. We don't know what's been wrong with them a lot of times. They seem to be tuning him out. There was times where they said we might need a new voice. And when you have that going on, and you're getting ready to get bounced out in all likelihood in the playing game. I'm sorry. You deserve to be on the hot seat. He doesn't, deserve, he doesn't deserve to lose his job. That's but we need to look at him and say, wait a minute. We got to keep an eye on this because it doesn't seem right. Keeping an eye on it to me is not the hot seat. I agree that you have oh, yeah. to always constantly evaluate and reevaluate. But one season... Not in the con three out of four seasons. You're in the conference finals when those guys were babies, when Hayward's coming off a catastrophic injury, right? When Kyrie didn't have the best effect on the team. And then one season when Kemba's hurt most of the year, when now Jalen Brown is out, when, as I said, you're missing a veteran who could move the ball in the starting lineup, you're probably going to get bounced in the play in, I would imagine. And that one thing has you on the hot seat. Saying you have to evaluate, keep your eye on it. See how these guys respond to him is fair, but not hot seat. It's too much. If Now, if Kemba was healthy all year, and then even forget about Hayward, you got to adjust. If Kemba's he healthy all year, they're not going through COVID, COVID protocols and everything, and this was still, and they had Jalen Brown now, and they got bounced in a playing game? Max. You got it. Hot seat at least. That's not what happened. You're talking about fairness, and I can appreciate where you're coming from. I'm talking about reality. And let me tell you what the definition of a hot seat is in the National Basketball Association from someone who's been covering it for a quarter century. When they are talking about you as a voice that has been tuned out, even if you're not fired, the reason why that's a hot seat is because the second next season starts. If you don't start off right, 
you could lose your job in the first month of the season. That's a hot seat. A hot seat is when yep. literally you could be gone. There have been situations he in the National be. Basketball Association where we had a guy on the hot seat and then the next season would start and they didn't even last a month or two. That's a hot seat. Real quick, both That's of right, you, Stephen, Stephen A. Max. The question is, the question is, should he be? And the answer is no. That, that's reality. I understand you're talking reality, but you're asking me should. I did he say should? he no. should be on the hot seat. Sorry, I said right. he should not Bef be fired. No, no, no. It's all be good. Be uh, before we wrap it up, Stephen A., you go first, then Max will give you the last word. How far do you think Boston is actually going to go? I think Boston gets bounced out in the play-in. I don't think they even make it to the first round of the playoffs. Max? Agreed. They're going to get bounced. And Stephen A., I have one question for you. Wait, where can I find Stephen A.'s world? ESPN Plus. Every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. ESPN Plus. Monday, right, Tuesday, guys. Thursday, Friday. When we come back. World. And you have all kinds of guys on there, you know, talking, you know, letting you know, players, Tatum, Brown, these kind of guys. Got it. Gotcha. Yeah, it's Stephen A's world. You know, he brings on whoever he wants. Steph Curry finishes the regular season as the scoring champ, and LeBron liked what he saw. Supposedly, high praise from LeBron. Or was it just gamemanship? The King's sincerity debated next. And speaking of potential strategies, excuse me, did the Clippers... Steph Curry is the NBA scoring king for the 2020 season. The two-time MVP scored 46 points in 40 minutes Sunday in a 113-101 win over the Memphis Grizzlies, helping the Warriors clinch the eighth seed in the Western Conference, setting up the Dubs for a Wednesday road game against the Lakers. That's right here, ESPN 10 Eastern. John Morant showing love, tweeting this. MVP, no debate. LeBron co-signed that Steph's MVP. Take a listen. For playing... Uh... First, in my, in my opinion, the MVP of our league this year, um, and, and Steph. So you know, we got to be, you know, prepared for everything that they have. They got championship DNA as well. You know, they know what it takes and what it feels like to be in pressure games. So you know, we got to be ready for that opportunity and for that uh, for that pressure. Stephen A. Do you think LeBron's being sincere there, saying that Steph's MVP, and then keep in mind they're playing each other? Well, I, I'm not going to question his sincerity with it. I'm just going to say I think there's some gamesmanship there, and and to me. I, I, I'm, one of, I'm one of those people, listen, it's no big deal. I ain't losing sleep over it. But I, I, I prefer, let me just put it to you this way, because I'm going to be nice this morning. I'm going to be nice. I mean, I'll save my vitriol for Max Kellerman. I'm not going to aim it in the direction of LeBron James here. But I, 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 want, a little, I, I want a little animosity. I, I, want, I, I want LeBron knowing that Steph is coming to slay the king. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and what's up? We ready. I want that. You know, one of the things that guys from the past, and again, I'm relatively old school, and, and guys from the past, I really, really appreciated it. You don't have to go to the extreme of Pat Riley where he didn't want guys being friends at all off the court and stuff like that. But I also don't want you on the court singing kumbaya to one another, hugging one another. You know, like, I, I, I don't need all that. I mean, we, we about to go at it. You see what I'm saying? And I, the intrigue that comes with just a touch of animus before you encounter one another is appealing to the viewer. And that is something that LeBron James almost has never, ever given up. He's such a likable guy, you know, and, and you see stars around him and, and you know, he, 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 he loves on them. They love on him. He's a lot of fun. They joke around and stuff like that. I remember years ago when him and D-Wade were going up against each other after they left, or uh, after he had left Miami and stuff like that, they hugged each other so damn much on the court. Everybody was well, like, what the hell's tight. going on? Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that I know they're going to go at each other. Yeah. But for, from a fan's perspective, you want to sense a little bit of animus just on a basketball court. Okay. You want to sense like, I'm a bust your living, you know what, here I come. You want to see it, you want to know it's coming, you want to feel it. And I'm not saying you don't necessarily feel that here. I, I, I'm just saying that it, it, it doesn't escape me that that, that he, he, you know, he doesn't speak ill of the competition. And, and, and it's had a contagious effect because we don't see too many dudes doing that in today's NBA game. And some of us miss it. I'm with you, Max. Well, I mean, is this... Like, you're saying you miss the gamesmanship. Yeah, I kind of do too. But I think he's not only being sincere, I don't think LeBron needs to butter anyone up. Like, hey, Steph, I'm saying nice things about you. Take it easy on me, will you? No, I think this is like the Bob Gibson quote, one of the greatest pitchers of all time. 
He said, the best catch ever is like watching the girls go by. The, the prettiest one is the last one you saw. That's the best catch ever. Same thing here with LeBron and Steph and MVP, I think. He's seeing a league where, look, James Harden was balling, got hurt. Embiid was balling. LeBron was balling. KD was balling. They all got hurt. Jokic been balling wire to wire. But the last game for a lot of the season, they looked like he got tired, right? Or a little hurt. Steph Curry not only had a really good season the whole time, but put the pedal to the metal recently. Last month or so, he's been out of his mind. So the lasting impression that LeBron has about Steph is that. And if you ask him about it, he's gonna tell you that's the MVP. I don't think he's sitting down and like really thinking about from beginning to end, maybe he is, because Steph has played himself, I think, into the number two spot behind Jokic. But I can't blame a dude, especially who's about to compete against that guy. Like, what do you have to brace for? And LeBron's thinking, I got to brace for the dude who had the best season in the league this year. Whether I agree with him or not, I get recency bias and how he could really think that because Steph has been impossibly great, especially over the last, what, 30 games or so? Yep. It's, been, it's been ridiculous. I think he's just telling you the truth. Let me throw something at you, and maybe it's a little bit of the cynic in me, Stephen A. But first we had LeBron come out with the comments, and he said, you know, I'm not 100%. I never know if I'll be 100% again. And now he's saying Steph's the MVP. I think he's just setting up the narrative like, hey, when we beat Steph and the Warriors and we take them out real quick, I beat the MVP. Or um, when I win this chip, I wasn't 100%. And, and he's just setting us up here, and that's kind of would, the direction I, I, of where I, he's going with I it. I wouldn't accuse him of that. Um, he clarified his position about never being 100% last night when he spoke, or Saturday, rather, when he spoke to the media. He was like, he said maybe he should have clarified it, and people ran with it. Well, damn it, it was because there's a lot of people that don't know the game, didn't know what he meant, and he knew that, and that's who he was speaking to mm -hmm. when he said it. So he's the one that left it out there. But what he was saying is that, you know what, you never feel fresh. Once you start playing in this game, you're never 100% a game. You might be 99%, but you're never 100 There's always some little tweak or whatever that you could afford to use. You, you could afford to have at your disposal. That's all he meant by that. And I don't think it's one of those situations where he's saying, okay, if I'm not 100% and I still slayed the giant, that is Steph Curry. Believe it or not, even though Steph Curry is lethal, LeBron has bigger fish to fry. The fact is, you're a reigning defending NBA champion. Utah, Phoenix, the Clippers, Denver, they all are there waiting for you with home court advantage and if you get through them the brooklyn nets with kyrie and i say kyrie instead of kd because even though we know kd would love to be universally recognized as the best in the world and what have you as opposed to lebron kd wasn't lebron's former teammate kd wasn't the one that wanted out from playing under lebron's shadow that would be Kyrie Irving. And so Kyrie Irving going to the finals against LeBron James, that would be headline material all day, every day when it comes to those two going at it and putting on a show on the court if the finals came to that. LeBron actually has bigger fish to fry than Steph. It's just that Steph is so lethal, Steph could interrupt everything by knocking the Lakers off Wednesday night, even though that wouldn't eliminate the Lakers from the possibility of making the postseason. Max? I mean, when, when Stephen A. talks about gamesmanship, Stephen A., you actually told me my favorite sports story of all time, and it was about Michael Jordan. And I'll just give you the cliff notes, everybody, that Jordan used to antagonize opponents before playoff games. And when Stephen A., you told me this story, I was like, yeah, of course, because he wants to throw them off their game. Muhammad Ali used to do the same thing, right? Get them angry, get them off kilter, and you take advantage. Stephen A., you told me, no, Jordan did it because he wanted that dude at his best so that when he beat him, that dude knew and Jordan knew, I beat your best, which is why he's saying Anita's Baker is giving you the best that I got to him, right, while he was giving him work. Stephen A., that's like sports nc17 content like that that type of thing especially i guess for people in our generation it's like oh my god i love that lebron's not that he's a different kind of cat but not everybody has to be like jordan or kobe lebron's doing it his own way i got no problem with it all right
We'll leave it there, guys. Uh, when we come back here on First Take, all eyes on Russell Westbrook in the play-in tournament. What's at stake for him in these playoffs? The fellows discuss Russ's legacy and what's on the line for Brody. Uh, Kyrie Irving finishing his regular season by joining the exclusive 50-40-90 club. But that's not what's on his mind. The fellows discuss Kyrie's mindset as the playoffs, the play-in tournament, gets started tomorrow. So if you are confused at all, Listen up. Here's how it all went down. I'm going to break it down for you. So the 7th and 8th teams will go head-to-head, -head and they must win two games to earn a playoff spot in the East. We'll see the 7-seed Celtics take on the 8-seed Wizards. The Celtics are looking to make the playoffs for the 7th straight season. Out West, the Lakers are the 7-seed taking on the 8-seed Warriors. L.A. won two of their three regular season meetings against Golden State. The 9th and 10th teams must win two straight games to earn a playoff spot. The 9-10 matchup in the Eastern Conference is Pacers Hornets. The Hornets are seeking their first playoff appearance since the 2015-2016 season, while the Western Conference matchup will pit the Grizzlies against the Spurs. The Grizzlies seeking their first playoff appearance since the 2016-2017 season. The winner of the 7-8 game will move on and become the 7th seed. The loser of the 7-8 game plays the winner of the 9-10 game to determine the 8th seed. The loser of the 9-10 game is eliminated. Got that? Make sense? Good. That was a lot, but I'm here for you all. Uh, Russell Westbrook will be ready for the play-in after a historic first season with the Washington Wizards. Last week, Westbrook was honored in pregame for breaking Oscar Robertson triple-double record with 182. Stephen A. Smith, yeah. what's at stake for Russ in these playoffs? Relevancy. Let me explain. Russell Westbrook, and I'm going to say it again. Because people just don't get this message. Russell Westbrook is a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. An electrifying talent. Box office. Everything he said about himself is right. Plays hard every night. Never cheats the game. Uh, never cheats the fans with his effort. It's phenomenal. And the triple doubles are the triple doubles. There is no denying it. And I appreciate the Wizards giving them a plaque with the jersey, the number 182 on it for all time, triple doubles and all of this other stuff. The Washington Wizards are in eighth place. Granted, it's not 10th like they were last year. They're in eighth place now. They're in eighth place. I expect them to win the play-in. And then I expect them to go home in the first round. And if they go home in the first round, that means... Four times over the last five years, we have seen one of the greatest talents this game has ever seen home in the first round. Now, I don't know about everybody else, but that doesn't excite me. I want to see this man compete for a championship. And it's not all his fault. Let me be very clear about this. First of all, let me give props to Scott Brooks. Mm -hmm. I think Scott Brooks, their defense was horrid. Even though it is not much improved, it, it, was, it was improved enough. And it wasn't just about Westbrook. I'm a huge Bradley Beal fan. And, and, and Scott Brooks can coach, has done a good job, a damn good job mm -hmm. over the last couple of months. And Russell Westbrook has been the leader. And clearly they won the trade with Houston for John Wall. Don't tell me the Washington Wizards are not better off. They are better off. Russell Westbrook has made them better. What I'm saying is that this is the most athletic point guard in the history of basketball. This dude is a guy that we were accustomed to seeing. Last time we saw him deep into the playoffs was when they had a 3-1 lead on the Golden State Warriors. And we thought they were going to knock off that 73-win team. And come to find out, Steph and Clay and those boys came back and closed the deal and beat them out. Russell Westbrook, the only time he has been out of the first round since was when they lost, when, when he was with Harden last year in Houston. And obviously he came down with COVID before the bubble play and all of that stuff and being the warrior that he is, he went there and tried his best, et cetera, et cetera. All I'm saying is that when I look at Russell Westbrook, I appreciate all the accolades, but it gets to a point where, all right, these are individual awards. What individual award don't you deserve? As incredible as you are, we know what you can do. There's one thing missing now. And the one thing, I'm not even talking about the chip. I'm talking about competing for it. 
literally being in that picture because just like other team, other dudes moved on and they were in a position to demand themselves being in a better situation. Russell Westbrook could have done that, but he didn't do that in this particular situation. He chose to depart from Houston and ended up in Washington. And I'm just looking at it and I'm saying, yo, I see what you're doing. I know how great you are. But when those playoffs are deep and you home watching it with the rest of us, America and the basketball world is being robbed of watching one of the great, most ferocious talents this game has ever seen. We're, why, we're not getting to see you competing for the championship, but we, got, we see your numbers. I, if it does that for everybody else, cool. That don't do it for me. I want to see this brother compete for a championship. That's all I'm saying. And it's not all his fault, but that's what I'm saying. Well, that's, that's not going to happen this year. I mean, not right. where they're seated if they get through the play, which I expect them to do, by the way. That's not going to happen this year. And that's not Russell Westbrook's fault. Look, Russell Westbrook, the league has changed, Stephen A., to the point where if you're the primary ball handler and you can't shoot, that is an enormous disadvantage in this era for, for, for winning championships. Like, what's the problem with the Sixers? Ben Simmons can't shoot. Otherwise, they're ready to go right now. And even so, they'll make a run because they're loaded. They got a lot of shooters. Westbrook can't shoot. Can't shoot. That's what's holding them back. That's it. But I agree that he hasn't made a lot of deep runs commensurate with his talent. I don't see the downside here. I see all upside. Because if he makes a little run right now, he can add to his legacy. I don't see a downside if he can't get out of the first round here for Russell Westbrook. And let me say something else about Russell Westbrook. He has been victimized by circumstance, not just because the league changed, right? Once upon a time, as great as we think he is, we think he's even greater. Not just because the league changed. What keeps happening to Westbrook? Three years ago, right? And by the way, because OKC is cheap. They had all these amazing dynasties possible, and they don't want to go into luxury tax and everything, So they, and, and Westbrook was the guy who stayed around, right? So what did he have to deal with? A constantly changing team. Here's Paul George. Okay, now i got to figure this out. First half of the season, Westbrook's not the same. Second half of the season, he figured it out. Oh, damn, Westbrook's as good as ever. He just changed his game for the team, just like we say Harden. Not selfish. He's not selfish. He's just doing what the team needs. Westbrook had to figure it out. Then the next season, he's traded. Now he's not only on a Houston team, but on a Houston team with James Harden, he's got to figure that out. First half of the season, mm, I don't know. Then he figures it out. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Westbrook's an animal. Same as always. Maybe better. Look at him. He's a point center. Same thing this season. Gets traded again. Three different teams in three years. Got to do it all again. Figure it out with Bradley Beal. Why can't you all win? There, he's figuring it out. Second half of the season. Look at this. Westbrook setting records. He's as great as ever. He's an MVP caliber player still. So those events... The, the league changing, needing the primary ball handler to shoot, which is not one of his talents. It's really the only one he doesn't have. That victimized him, but especially the fact that he was on a cheap franchise, and then he got moved twice, so three teams in three years. He's been victimized by circumstance. In these playoffs, Stephen A., anything he does is gravy. And by the way, him and Bradley Beal in that backcourt, who knows? They're, they're underdogs. I don't think they're going to do it. But who knows? He has a chance Max. to add. I don't see any subtraction here. I know that, Molly, you had a question. Yeah. I just have to address something that Max said. Go for it. What you just said was utterly ridiculous. Russell Westbrook's in his 13th year. Prior to him going to Houston last year, Max, what was the narrative? When he went, I'm telling you, now, now see, this is where it gets uncomfortable because I'm perceived as being negative on Russell Westbrook when I'm one of his biggest fans. OK, for years, I raved about him. But when I when I went off about it, I didn't care about a 35, 21 and 14 performance, everybody that was getting on me for getting on Russell Westbrook ignored the fact that I was pointing out you 13 games under 500. What the hell are y'all celebrating for? That's what I was saying, okay? But now that's no longer relevant because they've played their way in a top eight seed in the NBA playoffs. But at the time that he departed, from or before he departed from Oklahoma City, when Kevin Durant departed, what was the scuttlebutt about? Max, you talked to enough people around the league. You've seen people come on these shows. You've talked to people out there. What were they saying? Kevin Durant could never win with Russell Westbrook. 
And Stephen A., you need to stop. This is what, this is not me saying this. This is people in the NBA getting on me for getting on Kevin Durant for leaving. And they were like, yo, you couldn't win with Russell Westbrook. And years before that, people were saying that. And then after he departed, and it was Victor Oladipo, and it was a Paul George, or it was James Harden again, or whatever. What they were saying was, excuse me, because of his style of play, his aggression, his veracity, and all of those things being considered, but he's also an alpha male. How does that mesh and how does that work? They were questioning those things about him. It wasn't me questioning it. It was other people in the NBA that were questioning it. So you can't sit up here and say it was circumstances and it was not his fault because if you're saying that, that means for the first 11 years of his career, that means for the first 11 years of his career, people were lying. And that's not what folks were saying up until, uh, you know, they weren't saying that. uh, Stephen A., I'm not. I'm not absolving him in every era. Well, if only Jordan wasn't there, Barkley, Malone, Stockton would have had championships. There's always Jordan there or LeBron there or, a, a, you know, th- that's how we figure out who's the best of the best. I will. So I'm not saying none of that is on Westbrook. I think mostly it's his shooting. Right. And we could dress it up. If only he played this way, that way you can't win. No, he, he, he can shoot it a little better. It's just not like he does everything except shoot the ball. I think also, though, when you look at his teams, the real team that had a chance to win the championship was the 16 team. They lost to the Warriors, who lost to the Cavs. And then what has KD proven without Westbrook? That he can go to a 73-win team and win a couple championships? Yeah, who, like Paul George could have done the same thing. Any all-star you add to that that Warriors team is going to crush everyone. They already were just about the best ever, right? So Westbrook hasn't had that fortune. Westbrook keeps going to new situations. That's what I'm saying. That how many teams has he really been on? And you looked at and you said, yeah, they can win the championship. One, maybe two, maybe, maybe. And the one where you said, yeah, he got to a conference finals. We could see uh, KD versus Russ in the first round if they do take care of business against Boston. And the Wizards will go home. Okay. When we come back, the Clippers lost their last... Don't say it in that voice again. Their last two games, and some are saying it was intentional. Did the Clips do their best to avoid seeing the Lakers early in the bracket? And was it weak? The late great Kobe Bryant... Sunday night in Brooklyn, Kyrie Irving locked in an astounding 50-40-90 season. This means shooting percentages of over 50%, uh, field goals overall over 40% on threes and more than 90% from the free throw line. He becomes the ninth player in NBA history to do so. Despite, despite that, excuse me, Kyrie shared a bit with the media over the weekend on where his focus is. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like, a lot of stuff is going on in this world, and uh, basketball is just not the most important thing to me right now. There's a lot of stuff going on overseas. All my people are still in bondage all across the world, and there's a lot of dehumanization going on. So, you know, I apologize if I'm not going to be focused on y'all questions. You know, it's just too much going on in the world for me to just be talking about basketball. Like, I focus on this 24-7 most of the time, but it's just too much going on in this world not to address. My goal out here, my purpose is to help humanity, and I can't sit here and not address that. You know, um, I don't care which way you stand. On either side, if you're a human being, then you would support, you know, the, the uh, anti-war effort that's going on. There's a lot of people losing their lives, children, a lot of babies. And, um, you know, that's just what I'm focused on. So if you guys want to ask me questions about the game, I, I, you know, I really don't care about it. But uh, except just, you know, everybody leaving out of the game healthy and being able to go home to their families. Stephen A. I'm trying to find a delicate way to say what I want to say. Kyrie Irving really, really doesn't get how he's been coming across. So let me try to break this down. Do you really think that people don't care that others are starving? Do you really think that people don't care that people are dying? Do you really think that people don't care? It could be the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It could be racism and prejudice. It could be our nation's sordid history involving slavery and beyond. It could be all of those things. 
He doesn't realize that when he says stuff the way that he's saying, you're implying that other people don't care. But you do. I know Kyrie cares. I truly, truly believe his heart is in the right place. I would also like to remind Kyrie Irving that you played 17 games as a collegiate athlete, but you still ended up going in the NBA and generating millions of dollars for yourself. How much would you be focused on these issues if you had to worry about paying your bills, feeding your family, and surviving? He wouldn't have to be concerned about those things. Now, why do I bring that up? Because it's not what he feels, it's who he's talking to, why he says it. I really, really don't care what y'all have to ask. That's not what's on my mind. You can't chew gum and walk at the same time. You just finished playing basketball. That is your job. And what you're saying is that it's not important. Now, you haven't played like it because he's a showstopper. He's box office. He's absolutely electrifying. And we have to pay attention to that. You walk through the turnstile to see Kyrie Irving because he's that special. Mm -hmm. But the flip side to it is that, my God, you better win. Because when you sit up here and you have that kind of attitude, but then... You go out there, if you lose, when the expectation is for you to win, people are going to point to moments just like that. And the reason they're going to have an attitude with you is not because you cared and you may have prioritized somebody, something else in the crevices of your mind more so than basketball. It's that you're implying that other people don't. When you say stuff like that, we all care about that. We don't want to see people dying. We don't want to see people struggling. We don't want to see people starving. Of course, particularly if you're black, you have been ravaged by racism and prejudice and bigotry and being marginalized and minimized. We all go through that. This is not new to him. So when you sit up there and you look at people and you say stuff like that, you're talking to other people and you're saying, well, this might not be on your mind, but it's on my mind. And the fact is, you don't know. It's just that people may have jobs to do like you have a job to do. So while you're there, just do it. Do your job. And part of his job is, oh, my God, stop the presses. Your job might actually be not just playing basketball, but answering questions about it for 10 minutes. Oh, my God. Uh, is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Wait, really? Did, have we done something that tragic, Max? Where to ask you about your job. Come on, man. Come on, man. I hear everything you're saying, Stephen A. Um, I'm not going to get on Kyrie today about that. I didn't get him on, on him last time because I think we've all felt in life where we've seen some things going on in the world or, or learned about them and said, wait a minute, the world should stop spinning right now until that's addressed. Like, I, I, we should not be paying attention to any trivial thing in the world until that's addressed. So I hear you, Kyrie, and I agree with you. There are terrible things happening in this world. And sometimes as, answering questions about basketball or anyone doing their job feels ridiculous. Ridiculous. Until, whoa, 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 everybody, all seven billion of us, let's take care of that, right? But what Stephen A., what you're talking about is being a professional. You know who I think about? Our colleague here at ESPN, Teddy Atlas. Ever talk to Teddy or read anything that Teddy's written about his father and how his father showed him how to be a professional, what that really means? Talk to Magic Johnson. Talking about, like, I can't get the, the, new, the papers or, or the, what was it, the garbage, his garbage cut off the stoop. It's frozen. His dad's a kid when he's a kid. Get it. it doesn't matter if it's frozen. Our job is to collect that. You go chip the ice away and go get it, right? About being a professional. Stephen A., your mother, my father. These people spent decade after decade after decade um, making a living caring for large families, right? You can't miss a day of work. You know, you can't be sick. Don't get sick. And if you are, figure it out. Being a professional, I get every single thing you're saying. I would just say to Kyrie that I get how you feel, Kyrie, and oftentimes I and many feel the same way. And I appreciate 
that when microphones are in front of your face and cameras are on you, you're saying, wait a minute, people are listening to me right now. We can't talk about a pick and roll. I need to talk about babies dying and how to stop this. Kyrie, I hear you and I agree. I would just like to point out something, and Stephen A., I think essentially we're agreeing on this, but you tell me if, if it's anything different. The reason the microphones are on you and the cameras are on you is because you're great at basketball. That's why people care what you say. And if you really care about even delivering that message, if you want to amplify your voice to change the world, as stupid as it may seem, win. Win. Stephen A. Muhammad Ali would not mean what he meant in history. He'd be more of a footnote if he lost to George Foreman in Zaire. That's just the way it is. People would not be talking about him the same way, and he would not have had the voice he had. So if Kyrie is really serious about this, and I believe in his sincerity about this, win. No, not just be box office. Do your best to amplify your voice. And however you feel, whatever this means about the society you live in, People will pay attention if you win. Uh, can I ask, uh, uh, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question here. And if anybody is offended by this, my apologies, because I mean no offense. Do we get to pay attention to the ratings? And the fact that some would argue, whether it's true or not, that one of the reasons the NBA has struggled because of all the attention that has been brought to things. We understood what happened last year. We understood how tough last year was. We understand the need to make sure that nobody forgets, no matter what the, the, the situation is. Right now, you know, just recently, it was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Of course, there was George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on and on and on. And we were here on the air bringing attention to those things, too. But when does it come a point in time where the NBA... For example, in this particular instance, as the playoffs are about to begin, would a year that has ravaged the economy, it's left over 22 million people unemployed, and you're looking for a reprieve, at least momentarily, from all the things that plague us as a society, when does the NBA get to sit up there and say, while we lose hundreds of millions of dollars because the COVID-19 pandemic and other things have ravaged our business, but y'all are still getting paid. When do we get to look at you and say, could you help us continue to market this product, not just with your play on the court, but when you show up in press conferences? Because as people watch and we're trying to get an audience back, isn't it somewhat incumbent upon the people being paid to entertain and to play this game, to make a contribution towards helping our bottom line. At some point in time, we got to be adult enough and grown up enough to have those kind of discussions. Because last time I checked, there's nobody on the planet stopping Kyrie or any other athlete from going out there and preaching and talking their talk about their truth and what's going on in this real world. What they're saying is, let's not convolute it to the point where we think that's what we have to talk about and we get to ignore what part of our job description is. Yep. And I think that's important to recognize because we have to do it. You got issues. Molly, you got some issues you care about daily. Yeah. I have issues I care about daily. So does Max. But it doesn't mean that we get to come on first take and talk about those issues and not talk about sports because that's our job. Yep. But there's another novel idea also. Say you're answering questions for 10 minutes. You can answer questions about basketball, and then you can sneak in a little bit about what's sure. on your mind and your heart. And sure. really where you're headed. So you could do both. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, interesting discussion, As guys. opposed to telling the world, I'm really not interested. I don't care what y'all ask me about that. Really, while, you want, while people are getting ready for the playoffs. I don't care. All right, so what you going to say next? It don't matter if you win. Is that next? Because it matters to a whole bunch of people in Brooklyn. I can assure you that. More than just Brooklyn. All right. Nobody knows how dangerous LeBron James can become postseason time like his former coach Ty Luce. So were the Clippers smart to avoid King James early in the bracket? I can't wait for this debate. Kobe Bryant takes his rightful deserving place in the Hall of Fame and won. All right, so the Clippers' losses over the weekend helped them avoid playing the Lakers. Now, if the Lakers beat the Warriors on Wednesday, the Clippers and Lakers couldn't meet until the conference finals. Max, are the Clippers smart or are they scared? 
I, I would say stupid. You know, first of all, the Clippers should want the Lakers in the first round when the Lakers still don't have the chemistry, when they're cold, when they're ailing a little bit. You want to wait until they got a rhythm, till they're warmed up? No. I'll tell you something else. Clippers never get to the, to the conference finals, but they might beat the Lakers in the first round, Stephen A. We know they lose in the second round. Catch them in that first round. Interesting take. Huh. What do you think of that? I will tell you, I'm not going to tell you what they are because I'm not going to disrespect them without, you know, without speaking to them about it first. But I'll tell you how they look. They look scared. They look scared. And here's the reason why. Could you imagine if you're the Clippers coming off of blowing the 3-1 lead last year and then you go into the first round of the playoffs and you lose to the Los Angeles Lakers in the first round mm -hmm. after letting go of Doc Rivers, after shipping Lemon Pepper Lou to Atlanta? Uh, then, now, I don't say that disrespectfully. I ain't got nothing but love for Lou Williams. The point is, is that you made some changes. You acquired Rondo and stuff like that. You do that, you look scared. Yeah. You look scared. They losing on purpose to avoid the Lakers. You know who never looked scared or was avoiding people? That would be Kobe Bryant. Mm. Uh, Vanessa Bryant accepted the Hall of Fame honor on behalf of her husband on Saturday night. Let's take a listen to a portion of the speech. I used to always avoid praising my husband in public because I felt like he got enough praise from from his fans around the world and someone had to bring him back to reality. Right now, I'm sure he's laughing in heaven because I'm about to praise him in public for his accomplishments on one of the most public stages. I can see him now, arms folded, with a huge grin saying, isn't this some sh <laughs> Kobe was one of a kind. He was special, he was humble, off the court, but bigger than life. To all of our close friends and family that have been present for my girls and I, thank you. I don't have a speech prepared by my husband because he winged every single speech. He was intelligent, eloquent, and gifted at many things, including public speaking. However, I do know that he would thank everyone that helped him get here, including the people that doubted him and the people that worked against him and told him he couldn't attain his goals. He would thank all of them for motivating him to be here. After all, he proved you wrong. I remember asking him why he couldn't just sit a game out because he was hurting. He said, what about the fans that saved up to watch me play just once? He never forgot about his fans. If he could help it, he would play every minute of every game. He loved you all so much. Kobe had many accomplishments. Five-time NBA champion, five-time New York Times best-selling author, 18-time All-Star, a league MVP and two-time finals MVP, two-time Olympic gold medal winner. He is also the first professional athlete to win an Oscar. The list goes on, but his most cherished accomplishment was being the very best girl dad. Usually people thank everyone that has helped them get here, but since I don't have Kobe's specific list, I want to thank my husband. He did the work, he broke those records, and he inspired people to be great. Congratulations, baby. All of your hard work and sacrifices paid off. You once told me, if you're going to bet on someone, bet on yourself. I'm glad you bet on yourself, you overachiever. You did it. You're in the Hall of Fame now. You're a true champ. You're not just an MVP. You're an all-time great. I'm so proud of you. I love you forever and always. Kobe Bean Bryant. Stephen A., I'll start with you. Um, your reaction to Vanessa's speech? Well, I thought it was a phenomenal speech. Um, every time I see her, I see, you know, MJ and them, and you're talking about Kobe. I just, 
you know, I miss my brother. Um, he was an incredible, incredible talent. And he was just a brilliant, brilliant brother uh, to speak languages as fluently as he spoke them. His business acumen, his intellect, uh, it was just off the charts. Um, and he was an incredible, incredible role model in that regard because to see this black man, you know, carry himself the way that he did with the level of intellect and poise that he exhibited, I just can't say enough about how brilliant he was because he was nothing short of brilliant. And I really, really appreciated her speech and my heart goes out to her and the beautiful children uh, that were left behind with his passing and that of his beautiful daughter, Gianna. The only thing that I feel compelled to add, to add, and I have to do this. Um, and I'm not blaming, I'd have no clue, Vanessa or the Lakers, or, I don't, I have no, I never asked and I won't, because it's none of my business. But I will say this, Kobe had a mother, Kobe had a father, Kobe had sibling. I never, I didn't see them, and I've never heard anybody utter a word about them. She did mention them. I watched the full okay. speech, okay. and she not. did mention them at the top. Okay. I did not see them during okay. the broadcast. I did not. But, I did not. I, but she yeah. did mention them. I watched, them. Her, well, you know, I, was, I went to the bathroom. I didn't hear that part. Yep. But thank God she did, because I'm not even talking about her. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the public at large. Mm -hmm. We talk so much about her loss, yeah. and we should. But he had parents. Yeah, she, and, and, she and, thanked and them for, for creating Kobe yes. and for raising Kobe but again, and I'm making not, I'm, him the I'm man. I'm not going with her. Yep. I'm, I got that. I, I'm just talking about all of us. Mm -hmm. We always bring her, a mother, a father, a sister. They don't have their child and their brother anymore. And we don't bring that up enough. And I wish we did. Max? First of all, as everyone's been saying, but you could plainly see it and hear it there. What a beautiful speech, beautifully articulated and delivered by Vanessa. That was great. And um, one part in particular that I, not just caught my attention, I think a lot of people noticed is that when she said, you know, I asked him once because he was hurting, why are you playing? He said, there's some kid, you know, up in the nosebleeds, maybe seeing me for the first time or the only time. And I owe him my best, basically. And that is something that almost three quarters of a century ago, Joe DiMaggio said. Joe DiMaggio said, um, you know, there's always a kid in the stands and it's the first or the last time he's ever gonna see me play and I owe him my best. The reason I bring that up is because three quarters of a century later, whether or not anyone's seen him played or even know what sport he played, right? The name Joe DiMaggio still rings bells and that will be the same for Kobe Bryant. There is a difference between, you know, Vanessa called them an all-time great. They're all-stars, they're superstars, they're all-time greats, and they're legends. And in the history of American sports, how many legends have there been? Kobe Bryant is one of them. That's what I was thinking watching Vanessa's speech. One other thing I was thinking about, too, guys, when I think about Kobe Bryant and that Mamba mentality— what a legacy it is that when I look at somebody like him and, and you think about Kobe Bryant, you think, I want to be better tomorrow. I want to be the best version of myself. I want to work harder. I want to come up higher. I want to correct my weaknesses. And that's really what Kobe embodied. And when we think about Kobe and we think about that Mamba mentality, like if I saw Kobe on the screen or Kobe speech, I'm like, oh, I can go run another mile. And, and that truly is his legacy, in my opinion. And I love seeing the dynamic, how uh, she was saying how she held him accountable, where it's kind of that tough love, where it's a lot of times you might see this. You get a lot of fans around you. So it's really your inner circle that keeps you grounded and you could see yeah. her role also in his success my boy jeff you met jeff i yeah. brought him up many times and my godson his name is nicholas brown doing a great great job just graduated from the university of arizona congratulations Congrats. to him had like a 3.8 gpa mm -hmm. met kobe bryant a few years ago kobe looked at him and said how come it ain't 4 -0? that's what i mean exactly how those kind of stories how come it's not 4 -0? he said you ain't got no job yet yeah. you're a kid you ain't got a family. He said, what's your distraction? How come it ain't for He makes you want to be better. He always makes and you Max, better. And Max, I'm glad you brought that part up about the fans, how he never wanted to cheat the fans, injured, sick, et cetera. Uh, it, it's truly remarkable. And he's right. Some people saving up all their money just to get to see him one time and, and how special that was. Uh, 
I don't know. When you talk about Kobe Bryant, really just speechless, and, and his wife, truly su such a queen. So my thoughts with their entire family. We will be back here on First Take tomorrow talking playoffs. Bye, guys.